Good morning and welcome to Southern Hills this morning. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors, as well as those of you joining us via live stream this morning. I hope everyone's had a chance to look at one of our bulletins, either got one from the foyer as you came in or looked at it online. Um, if not, there's still plenty of copies left back in the back foyer. Uh, but just a few announcements we'd like to make before we begin. First of all, we do want to wish all of our fathers a happy Father's Day. This is a special day, and we, we do appreciate everything that our fathers do for us. Um, also, we want to remember Sharon Welburn. Uh, she's going through chemo treatments right now. Uh, Barbara Jones had her last chemo treatment this past Wednesday. Now she'll be having some CT scans to begin and figure out how to begin um, immunity immunotherapy. Um, Donald McGrady has been moved to the Willow Springs facility in Spring Hill, uh, where he is now under hospice care. Also, Bobby Will Hoyt fell at home and she has broken her shoulder. Uh, Doug Smithson, he is actually with us today, so it's good to see Doug uh, back here. Mary Nell Hogg will be having knee replacement surgery on Tuesday. So we want to keep all of those in our prayers. Also, we want to extend our sympathy to the family of Carl and Sue Harper on the passing of Miss Sue. Carl and Sue were members here for many years, and Carl was one of our former, former elders. Um, actually, the arrangements are the funeral will be this Friday, um, and you can call the church office to get the exact time, but this Friday will be Miss Sue's funeral. And we also continue to extend our sympathy to the Burns family on the passing of Joe's grandmother, Isabel Linder, and her funeral was last Thursday in Franklin. We have lots of activities going on here at Southern Hills. Vacation Bible School will be July the 3rd through the 6th. More information about Vacation Bible School and decorating is in the uh, bulletin. If you have any questions, you can see Cody and Nikki Lovett or Rachel Potts. Our young professionals will be having a de devotional uh, tomorrow evening here at the building at 6.30. Dinner is provided. Uh, this does include all of our recent high school graduates, uh, so we encourage them to come be a part. And we are also sad to announce that Bobby and Wanda Ezel are going to be moving to Huntsville uh, to be closer to their daughter. So to help um, send them off with good wishes, we are planning to have a potluck lunch on Sunday morning, June the 26th after Bible class. Um, so more information about that is in the bulletin, but we are sad to see Bobby and Wanda move to Huntsville, but we know that it is best that they be close to their family. Uh, so those are the announcements that I have. We do also have one Bible here from Miranda Johnston. She was baptized into Christ Thursday evening at camp. So I know Miranda's here. I don't see her right now, but if she'll come and I'll meet her halfway and give her a Bible. And those are the announcements that I have for this morning. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful for the plan of salvation that you have set forth for us, that we can have a home with you in heaven one day. Father, we are thankful that we can pick up your word and read it at any time to read about your son and the, the sacrifice that he gave for us. Father, as we enter in this period of worship, we pray that you be with each one of us as we sing the songs, and listen to another message from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. So good to see each and every one of you here this morning. If you'll please stand and sing.
A psalm before our scripture reading opening prayer will be a shield about me. Thou, O Lord. opening prayer. Our scripture reading will continue from the book of Colossians, the second chapter, starting at verse 6 and reading through verse 15. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. I will be reading from the New King James Version. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can call you our Father. Today is Father's Day, and there are so many of us who have taken on that role to become fathers, but we fail to come up to the standard that you have set before us. You are the Father, you are the example, and to you all glory and praise and honor be given. We thank you for loving us in spite of our sins and our shortcomings and sending Jesus to be our Savior. We know that without him, there would be no hope of life, no forgiveness from sin, no peace in our hearts. We thank you so much, Father, for the demonstration of your love by Jesus offering himself up on the cross so that we might not have to bear the punishment for our sins. And we thank you. We thank you, Father, for the church that meets here. Thank you for our elders and our preachers and all those who work and teaching and reaching out. We thank you, Father, for the love that we have for one another as we look to you as our example. Father, there are so many people that are hurting right now, not only in our family here, but across the world. There's so much strife and division, so much hatred, so much violence. We pray that your message of the gospel will go out and touch the hearts of those who are hurting so badly, that they may come to know you and the peace that surpasses all knowledge through the obedience of the gospel. We pray that you would be with us as we lift up our voices to you in praise. We pray that you would help us to put all worldly thoughts aside, that we may focus on you and worship you and your son who has done everything for us. We pray that you would be merciful to us and help us to live up to the example that Jesus set before us. Please be with us now and help us to live for you. Forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' holy name, amen. So prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. We'll sing number 916 and then number 90. We gather
As we prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, I'd like to read real quickly through Hebrews chapter 10, verses 8 through 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 8 through 14. The Hebrew writer here is speaking about Jesus, and that's kind of the context here. So first he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second, and by that, by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day by day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when the priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who have been made holy. So we think about Jesus this morning. We're called every Lord's Day to remember him, remember his sacrifice on the cross for each one of us. So we think about that this morning. We think about Father's Day. We think of, as it says of Jesus there, he said, I have come to do your will. He came to do the will of the Father. Wouldn't we all like to have children that were always willing to do the Father's will at all times? And that's what Jesus did. He was the perfect son. He was the perfect sacrifice for each one of us. Uh, may we remember that this morning. We, went, and we have the opportunity to be made holy through that sacrifice, as this scripture reads as well. We have the opportunity, it's just a wonderful thought as he closes that verse 14, that we have the opportunity to be made perfect because of that holy sacrifice. So let's think about Jesus this morning. Let's be reminded once again of what he's done for us and never forget what he has done for us on the cross. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you most of all for your son and savior, Jesus. We thank you for him coming to this earth, for that perfect sacrifice he was for each one of us. The perfect son, the perfect offering, the only offering that would be pleasing to you to be that sacrifice on our behalf. We thank you so much for his sacrifice, his body that was broken on the cross for each one of us. Help us to be reminded of that at this time and always be reminded of what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Let's bow once more. Dear Lord, as we continue this remembrance of Jesus, may we think of his blood that was shed on our behalf. The pain and suffering he endured on that cross, the perfect sacrifice he was, the final sacrifice that once and for all put an end to our sin and gave us an opportunity to have forgiveness, to have the grace that you offer. We thank you for that sacrifice. We thank you for the blood that was shed, the suffering he endured on that cross for each one of us, the nails driven through his hands and his feet and spear driven through his side and the crown of thorns on his head. All which shed that blood that could cleanse us one day. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We also have this, at this time an opportunity to give back to the work here of the church. You'll see on the screen a few ways you can do that online or we'll pass the plates around here in just a moment where you can give there as well. Uh, let's pray together as we give thanks for this offering. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all you do for us. As we remember Jesus this morning, we thank you once again for him and that sacrifice. We thank you so much for all the ways you bless us individually and as a family. We thank you so much for all you do. We have so many things to be thankful for, so many blessings in this life. Help us to remind us that those all do come from you. Uh, as we look to give back to you this morning, may we do so cheerfully. May we be willing to give because you gave so much for us. We ask that you be with this, this offering this morning that we pray that it will be used to further your kingdom both in this place and around the world. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Before Brother, Brother Garrett brings us our lesson, we'll sing number 669. If you will please stand as we sing. This is my your Bibles, I would encourage you to open them to that passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to study verses 10 and 12 here in just a moment. I will take this time, um, as, as several have already, to wish all the fathers in here a happy Father's Day. Uh, we are going to talk somewhat about being a father and fatherhood. Um, I would say it's kind of interesting, like for me anyway, it's easier to preach Mother's Day lessons than it is to preach Father's Day lessons. And it's not because I like really like telling women what to do more than I like telling men what to do. It's more the fact that I am a father, right? And so you don't want to speak too glowingly of them because it sounds kind of arrogant. And then I uh, don't want to harp on them too bad because I don't think that's really what Father's Day is about. Uh, and so it's just kind of like this, this awkward type of thing. But that being said, it is interesting and beautiful, I think, how God structured family. That when God created a family, he created it as he creates everything with order. And when things are done orderly in the way that they're supposed to be, the way they were created to be, it is beautiful. And, and, and those uh, organizations, if you want to call them that, like function the way that they are supposed to function. And not without flaw, uh, people are flawed. And so you will always have problems. But when, when the home is as God intended it to be, you will find that those who are in the home, whether it be the, the, the father or the mother or the children, um, typically find fulfillment in that and, and uh, are, are the better because of it. And so as we turn our attention to like talking about fatherhood, we're actually going to talk about a passage which is somewhat interesting because it's not really about fatherhood. Uh, really, as we talk about Paul, like Paul's going to illustrate something as, as if he's a father, but he's not a father, right? He's a minister. And so as he talks to the church of the Thessalonians, like he's comparing his work with them and his ministry with them like the work of a father and his children. And so certainly I, I don't think we would take this and say, okay, this is only applicable to, to parents or to fathers. It, it, is, it is generally about being 
an influential man, really, or an influential person. If you're a minister, if you're uh, trying to influence people in any type of a way, uh, certainly as we turn our attention to fatherhood, like what I'm trying to do as a father is I'm trying to influence my children. I'm trying to lead them and, and steer them and direct them. And what you'll find about Paul is true is that as he's going through and he's writing to them, the first thing he'll do is he'll focus on himself. And then he talks about his instruction. And what you see after that is like there's a goal that, that he's, he's instructing them towards, right? So we go ahead and re, we read the passage. He is writing to the church of the Thessalonians and he says, you are witnesses and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you uh, believers. And so as, as he's talking about like his influence among them and his helping them and his directing and steering them, what he said, first of all, is that you'll look at our conduct and the way you perceived us and the way that we lived. And what you found in that behavior, the way we lived, is that it was holy and righteous and blameless. I want to talk briefly about each of those words because they are significant. And, and, and we'll get back to them in a moment. But he talks about this idea of holiness. Uh, you've heard me say this before. Like when, I, when, when you think of the word holy, uh, it, it is the word that, that I, I kind of say is like, it's God's word. And, and what I mean by that is it's all about, and this is like your proximity to God, your connection with God. Like the holiness of God is what sets God apart from the world. Like that, 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 that's what it means that God is holy, is, is, is a sense like you have the world and the world is its way, and then you have God and he's his way. And there's, they're just different. God is just different than the world. And, 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 and you look at the, the leaders of the world and the rulers of the world and the way worldly people are, and you look at God and his actions and his behaviors, and it's just different. When God came to this earth and walked among this earth as a human being in the man, Jesus Christ, what you'll notice is that he was so different than the world that they hated him, despised him, and killed him. He's just different. He talks different. He acts different. He behaves different. He treats his enemies different. He treats everybody different. God and the world are just different. We become holy when we become more like God. Like that's the idea of holiness, a connection with God, not connection with the world. All right, so like when I think of the, whole, the, world, the word holy, I think of the first time that it's ever used in the Bible. It's in, in the book of Exodus. You have this man named Moses and he's out tending some flock and he sees off in the distance a bush and it's on fire. And he walks over to that bush and he's told, stop, take the sandals off your feet because the ground you stand upon is holy. You say, hmm, why was that ground holy? Because God was there. It's the only reason the ground was holy. There was, there was nothing different about the dirt that day than it was the day before. It was holy because God was there. The last time the word holy is used in the Bible, it's actually kind of speaking of this new uh, Jerusalem and, and, and this, this heavenly abode that we, that we long to live in. And, and it's called a holy city. You say, well, why is this city holy? Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4 says, and God himself will live with them. And they will be his God and they will be his, or he will be their God and, and they will be his people. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There'll be no more pain for the former things that passed away. The idea is that this city is holy because people get to live with God. He's there. So whether it's in a bush, in a wilderness, or in this special city, it's holy when God is there. And every time throughout the Bible, you read of this idea of holiness, it's about a connection with God, consecration to God, like, 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 like connecting yourself with God. It's interesting. It's not just people. Sometimes even like, like you read through like the, the instructions of the tabernacle and like, like there's, there's, like, there's 
all kinds of things, clothes, and uh, there's um, utensils, and all of these different things that are described as holy. Why are they holy? Because they're for God's purposes. When you're holy, you're connected with the Holy God who is set apart and different than the world. It's not a, a, a garment or a utensil that's, that's used the way the world, it's, it's for God's purpose. And the idea of, of you and me and Paul, when we're holy, we are people who are not used and function towards the world's purposes, but we're connected with God in our lives and our behavior and our actions are, are geared towards God's purposes. And Paul says, you says, you saw me and you looked at my conduct and you saw the way I treated you who are believers and you saw it's holy. It's, it's towards God's purposes. I, I, and you could look and you can see in me a person who is connected with God. He says righteous. It, it's a word like generally it just means like good. But it usually has to do with like this, this discernment between good and evil. Oftentimes, like it, the same word is translated as just sometimes. Like the idea of like, like there are things that are wrong in this world and there are things that are right in this world. A just person sees the wrong and knows it's wrong and avoids it. He sees the right. He knows the right. And he does that. And so Paul says, you saw my conduct. You saw that I was connected with God, I was holy. You saw that, that I wasn't geared towards the wrong. I noticed the wrong. I evaluated it. And, and I, I, I saw the wrong as being what it was, wrong and sinful, and I avoided it. And I geared myself towards that which is right in God. Good, and that's what I did. And then he uses this word blameless. The word blameless is in interesting because you immediately read it, and like if you're like me when you first read that, you think innocent, or not innocent, but like 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 almost perfect, right? Like 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 I've never done anything wrong. I'm blameless. But but that's not really what this word is like emphasizing. The word's emphasizing like this innocent manner of life. Um, it's it's emphasizing like this. This way you conduct yourself that doesn't have any, you might say glaring or obvious um, sinful behaviors. It's, it's, it's the difference between somebody who we, we all as humans struggle in the way we speak sometimes. But there are some people who are just characterized by it. Some people are just foul-mouthed. It's not like they, they stumble or something. It's just that's, that's who they're, you could just label them. Oh, yeah, they're a foul mouth. Uh, or they're a gossip. Or they're a slanderer. They're this or they're that. And they know it and you know it. And you could be that way. It's not like they, they, they're people struggling with sin, fighting against. They are people who just, they are that way. And Paul says, when, when you saw us, like there was no like glaring obvious sin that we just give ourselves into. Not a perfect man. But you can't look at Paul and say, he's a liar. He just lies all the time. He's a gossip. He just gossips. He's a slanderer. He just slanders. Um, that you, you look at his life and you say, okay, there is a, there, there's a connection with God. He's holy. He chooses the right. He knows when it's wrong and he avoids it and he goes in the direction of the right and he conducts himself in a way to where you can't point a finger at him and say, ah, he's, just, he's just a fornicator or he's an adulterer or he's a liar or he's a slanderer or he's a gossip. Like there is no glaring sin that, that kind of defines him. And he was that way. And, and, and so too were those with him. He says, in, in all of our conduct towards you. He says, you witness this, God witnesses this, this is who we are. You can see it, you can evaluate it, and you know it. It's true of our behavior. Okay, so that being said, now he gets into this idea of, of this illustration of being like a father, right? He says, so, or he says, for you know 
How? Like a father with his children. So what he's going to be doing is he's going to be talking about his behavior with them and how it's comparable or should be comparable to the way the father treats his children. It's interesting. I I do think that like when you think about leadership in so many different ways, oftentimes what God wants out of the leaders isn't a whole lot different. What God wants out of, I think of myself, you know, I, I have different roles in my life. I'm a minister. I'm also a father. In a lot of ways, it's similar, right? The, the, those who are elders or deacons, like there's, there's a lot of similarities. Obviously, there's differences, right? Like, like, but, but, but there's similarities. And what Paul is saying is, okay, like, he might not be like an earthly father, but there's things within his ministry that, that are similar, the way God wants him to lead as an apostle is very much like he would want a father to lead his home. How so? He says, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you. Okay, now this is important. And I kind of went on with that point about his behavior was holy and righteous and blameless uh, for a reason. And that is because the word exhort, uh, it, it, it comes from a Greek word that you don't really need to remember, but it, it means par, it's parakaleo, which is basically two words put together, okay? So para is where we get over like parallel, right? So it's like alongside, it's a preposition. And then kaleo is to call. And so like, I, I called you alongside me. Is, is like, okay, so what did I do with you? Well, I encouraged you. And I called you to live like I live. Not not to be different. Not that I live this way and I want you to live a different way. What I want from you and what I expect from you is what I do. I have expectations for the way you talk, but you should see that in the way I talk. I have expectations for the way that Well, you might say in the home, you treat your mother, but guess what? You'll see the way that I treat her also. Like I have expectations for the way you conduct yourself towards your friends. I have the expectations for the way you conduct yourself towards your enemies. I have expectations for the way you work. I have expectations for so many areas of your life, but I'm not going to expect it of you if I'm not doing it. I'm exhorting you, I'm calling you along, I'm beseeching you or begging you to live in a sense like I live. That means like you've got to be holy and righteous and blameless, right? Like like you've got to watch yourself. I don't want you to live like I live if I'm not living right. As a father, you have to get your life in order. If you want to re- if you want your kids to put God first, they have to see that you put God first. If you want your kids to be holy, they have to see that you are holy. If you want your kids to be righteous, they have to see that you are righteous. If you want your kids to be blameless, they have to see that you are blameless. Kids have to see in you who you want them to be. He says, not only did he exhort them, uh, but he encouraged them. Now, the word encourage, it's interesting. Like I often say that the word encourage has two different meanings. The word that's used here is actually just focusing on one of them. And it has the idea of like a comforting. All right, that like like a, a father should see and be alert and attentive to the areas of life in which a child hurts. They should, they should comfort them. You know, it's funny, like when I think of that, like I usually think that's mom's job, right? But like, no, Paul is saying, no, like that's, that's what a father does. He comforts in the hurt. Uh, the, 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 the way I've often described the word encourage before is, is that it's like, I, I kind of think of it like, like if you have a son who's like, a, you know, playing baseball, he's 10 years old and you know, he goes out and he plays this game and he's, you know, he's playing this really important game and, and you know, 
the last inning and, and he's up to bat and his whole team is depending on him and he gets up and he strikes out. Like, he, he's going to go home and he's going to feel deflated and he might feel like giving up. And, and what a parent does, I know this because like, I've been in similar situations. Like my parents were like, one, tell me, no, they, 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 they try to make you feel better. My parents would like typically talk about like, like professional baseball players and you know, how even a good professional baseball player's you know, batting average is 300 something. Like they're getting out more than they, than they don't. And they're talking about all the you know, game winning shots that Michael Jordan missed. You know, and they're saying like, like, like you, you, didn't, you didn't hit the home run, and the, but like this isn't like most people don't, it's okay. And they're trying to make you feel better. But also what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep, keep you like from giving up. And that's kind of what this next word is about, where he says, uh, and charged you. So a father says, I'm, I'm going to exhort you. I'm going to call you along beside me. When I see you hurting, I'm going to comfort you. And when I see you, in a sense, failing, I'm going to charge you. I'm going to give you a charge. I'm going to give you something to work towards. Parents ought to lay out goals in front of their children that they can work towards. Give them something to aspire to. And what Paul says that he gave to them was a huge thing. What did he want them to aspire towards? Walking in the manner worthy of God. Big time. I want you to live in a way that's worthy of God. Who calls you into his own kingdom and glory? Now, I don't know if you remember this, but last week we talked about this idea of the kingdom of God. Um, and, and how you can't disassociate the idea of a kingdom with the idea of a king. Like they're crucially important. They, they, in your mind, you connect the two. When you think about the kingdom of God, you're thinking about the fact that God is king. And, and what Paul is saying is like, like a, I'm charging you to walk in a way worthy of God because it's God who calls you kind of into his kingdom. That is his reign or his rule. That, that God is the one who ultimately I want you to you know, bow your knee before. He's the one who ultimately that, that you need to submit to. And I think about that as a father, it's interesting, like, just like, why do, we, why do we instruct our children the way we instruct them? You know, I know that in my life, there is a point at which, and, and it's hard to put a finger on, like, I don't, know, I don't know when this happened, but at some point in my life, there was this transition from, I need to obey mom and dad or else I'm going to get in trouble. And at some point, a switch. And I couldn't tell you exactly when. But I stopped thinking as much about getting in trouble with mom and dad. And I started thinking a whole lot more about getting in trouble with God, you know? And like, like, like I started thinking more about the fact that, that it's, not, it's not mom and dad who are over me. But God is my king. You know, I think that that's the, 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 the brings you to like this more idea of like spiritual maturity. Like, like it's, it's this idea that as you grow old, like you start to get your focus right. And I don't think that there's any kind of disrespect to the parent. As a matter of fact, as a father, that's what the goal is. That's the charge. That's the aim. That one day, they're not going to watch what they say because I tell them to watch what they say. that they will have their speech seasoned with salt because that's what God wants. And God's called them into his kingdom, into his reign and into his rule, that they treat people not the way I told them to treat people, but the way God wants them to treat people. And like, there's this, this transition that has to take place and it has to take, take, take place in every one of us. 
You know, that, that, that some people will never get there in their minds. That what, what, what happens with some people is they transition from, I'm going to get in trouble with, with my parents, and that transitions to, well, I got to do this because I'll get in trouble with the law. Right? And like, like, like there's always like this like very human element to the reason I don't do bad things is because I don't want to like face these consequences. But my goal for my children is that they don't transition from me to the law or, or to whatever. I want them at some point to transition from what I say to God is my king. I'm gonna live the way God wants me to live. And, and I'll tell you, like, in that, like, as a father, I'm like, okay, like, that's what I want. That transition. And that's the charge. Throughout your life, comes a point where my command becomes almost unconsequential. Like, live the way God wants you to live. And that's Paul speaking to the church. That's Father speaking to their kids. Anyone who's leading other people in the areas of God, don't do what I tell you to. Do what God tells you to. Live under his reign. Live under his rule. Be a part of his kingdom. And and that should be the goal of anyone in, in their spiritual leading of somebody else. Fathers, that's the goal. Lead them to God. Let him take control. Let him give, give the rules, right? Let, let him be the one that they submit to. And, and that should always be what the aim is. If there's anyone in here this morning who is not yet a Christian, we certainly would love to help you become one. If we can study with you, we'd love to study with you. If we can pray for you, we would love to pray for you. Uh, if we could baptize anybody this morning, we would love to do that as well. If there's something we could do to help you in your walk with God, we want to give you this opportunity to sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing this invitation song. We walk with the Lord in the light of I do want to wish everybody a happy Father's Day. If you are visiting with us and you are a father, happy Father's Day to you, and we are so happy to have you here at Southern Hills.
And members, if you see a visitor, and I am seeing a lot, make sure that you lead them to their appropriate classes, introduce yourself, and lead them to their appropriate classes. We do hope you can all come back for our evening worship service at 5 p.m., and we do have classes prepared in the back for all ages. Our closing song will be number 756, when we all get to heaven. Number 756. Sing Father in heaven, we're grateful we've had the opportunity to gather as a family on this beautiful Lord's Day to worship you and to encourage one another. We're thankful, Father, that you loved us enough that you sacrificed your son on our behalf. Father, we're thankful for the word, for it increases our faith, and we pray, Father, that it will increase our wisdom as well and give us the wisdom to foresee sinful situations and the character to avoid them. We pray, Father, especially for our young people, that the word will strengthen their conscience and give them clarity and certainty on right and wrong and help them confront some of the evil weirdness they see in the world today. Father, we're, we wish that you would uh, bless those who are ill we pray, Father, that they will be healed, that those who are grieving will be comforted, and those who suffer in secret will know that they are loved. We pray, Father, as we approach this next week, that your light will shine bright within each one of us, and will each have a good positive impact on our little piece of the world. In your son's name we pray, amen.